Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. We have big progress with SpaceX's Starship as they prepare to launch the first ever Block 2 vehicle. New Glenn was vertical on the launch pad until it wasn't, until it was, until it wasn't again. Rocket Lab shared new test footage of Neutron's upper stage. China conducted the maiden flight of two new rockets and a new launch site. Russia delivered a spy satellite to space and much, much more. Enjoy. <laughs> down at Starbase, the pace has been a little bit more chill as we cool down in the aftermath of Starship Flight 6. We did see some rather peculiar goings on at the launch pad though. A couple of antennas were spotted strapped to one of the chopstick catch arms, for reasons that are a bit unclear. Furthermore, later in the week, the chopsticks were raised to full height, with these still attached. What do you think they were testing here? We know that during Flight 6, communications were temporarily lost between Super Heavy and the Tower, so maybe this test is something to do with that? Let me know your theory in the comments section. I'm really curious about this one. One of my favourite shots that came from the sixth flight of Starship is this brilliant footage of Ship 31 performing engine relight, flip and splashdown in the Indian Ocean, marking the first daytime landing of a Starship from space, as well as the presumed final ever flight of Starship Block 1, with Flight 7 expected to use Ship 33, the first Block 2 ship, as its upper stage. Which means that things are not looking too peachy for Ship 32, which remains in the rocket garden half clad with its outdated heat shield and no aft flaps. It's almost certainly slated for the scrap heap at some point in the near future. SpaceX isn't exactly sentimental when it comes to their prototype vehicles. RIP SN15, never forget. But anyway, even though Flight 7 will be the first time we see a Block 2 ship in flight, we sadly won't get a view like this one, as the landing time will once again be during the night, as was the case for Flights 3 through 5. This isn't without good reason though. According to FAA filings, Flight 7 is scheduled for launch in the early morning of the 11th of January, so that a NASA aircraft can film the Starship re-entry with thermal cameras fitted to a Gulfstream 5 during peak re-entry heating as it flies over the Indian ocean. The landing needs to take place at night for the best imaging conditions, and the aircraft will need to operate with both its interior and exterior lights turned off. Something that's obviously pretty risky, but Australia's Civil Aviation Safety Authority has expressed its readiness to allow this to take place. I really hope NASA or SpaceX share some of the aerial footage publicly, as that would be so cool to see. The first stage booster for Flight 7 is still expected to be Booster 14, a Block 1 Super Heavy. Currently, Super Heavy hasn't had a Block 2 version developed. If all goes to plan, then we will hopefully see SpaceX attempt to catch the booster using Mechazilla, like they successfully did with Booster 12 on Flight Test 5. There is a chance that we won't though, and the booster instead aborts the catch attempt and splashes down in the Gulf of Mexico, like Booster 13 on Flight 6, which we later learned was due to a loss of comms with the tower's computer. Some new footage has been leaked showing Booster 13 in the waters. This clip has already made the rounds on social media, so it's pretty much out there now, so I don't mind sharing it, and it's just bobbing around prior to it scuttling to the seafloor. In what feels like years, we finally saw some new activity at SpaceX's Roberts Road facility. Greg Scott captured this photo that seems to show the arrival of new orbital launch mount hardware and the reappearance of tower components, meaning that we might finally get to see work continue at Starship's launch pad at Launch Complex 39A and possibly a second Kennedy site. Work at the Cape likely halted for a few reasons, chief among which was the fact that this was NASA's only crewed launch launch pad, so if a Starship mishap occurred, then America would be at the mercy of Russia for human access to the International Space Station. But now, it's okay, because Boeing is here with Starliner! <coughs> Okay, joking aside, SpaceX has since completed construction of the crew access tower at Pad 40, meaning that Falcon 9 can launch Crew Dragon from both Pad 39A and 40, so a pad incident with Starship wouldn't be too disastrous for NASA. Check out Greg's Patreon to help keep him in the air for us at Kennedy. He also captured this photo, Blue Origin's new Glenn vertical at the pad, but then it was lowered again, and then it went vertical again, and then within the past day it was lowered again. New rocket, new issues, I'm still optimistic about this thing's maiden flight. I can't believe that SpaceX have been landing orbital class boosters unchallenged for the best part of a decade at this stage. It's about time someone disturbs the waters. But not literally, I hope. I hope the booster successfully lands on the Jacqueline barge, which was spotted heading out to sea in the middle of last week for some testing ahead of the New Glenn first flight. 
For now though, we only have Falcon 9 to represent reusable first stage boosters for orbital class vehicles, and on the subject, we saw four Falcon 9 launches over the past week, all of which were Starlink missions. I'll again just cover these simultaneously since they're all basically the same, but the launches took place on Monday, the first launch of Starlink Group 12, Wednesday, Saturday, and Saturday again. All three of SpaceX's Falcon 9 launch pads were used, and all four first stage boosters made successful landings on the drone ships. The most recent launch was at 10 past 8 UTC on Saturday, and was somewhat more interesting than the others, as this mission carries 20 Starlink satellites and also two Star Shield satellites, which are the military equivalent to Starlink, developed by SpaceX and Northrop Grumman. This launch was also the maiden flight of Falcon 9 booster 1088. Hopefully we see a lot more launches and landings from the Falcon 9 fleet's newest member. In the early hours of Monday, Rocket Lab successfully launched an electron rocket from New Zealand's Mahia Peninsula, carrying five nanosatellites for French Internet of Things company Kinase. This was the third of five dedicated launches planned for the Kinase Internet of Things satellite constellation, and the launch was a success, with the satellites now fully operational in orbit. Rocket Lab's next launch for Kinase is anticipated sometime this month, with the fifth and final launch slated for early next year. Electron is currently Rocket Lab's only operational rocket, but they have big plans to disrupt the market when they debut their Neutron vehicle, which will land its first stage vertically, just like Falcon 9 and New Shepard. It's still being developed, and last week Rocket Lab shared this video of a wet dress rehearsal test for the rocket's second stage, successfully testing its flight avionics and the systems managing pressurance and propellants to mimic actual flight conditions. The rocket will launch from the Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia, and to that end, Rocket Lab are hard at work constructing the launch mount, which is quickly taking shape at Wallops Launch Complex 3. We had two maiden launches from China over the past week. Wednesday saw the debut of the Jiuquei 2E, a methalox fueled medium class rocket developed by Land Space, and the successor to the Jiuquei 2, which was the world's first methalox fueled rocket to reach orbit. The 2E isn't too different from its predecessor, most of the changes are to its second stage. The methane and oxygen tanks now have a common bulkhead structure, making the rocket lighter and more efficient. It has a new engine with thrust vectoring and an improvement to the design of the engine nozzle. The flight was a success, and the rocket successfully delivered two communication satellites to low Earth orbit. The other Chinese launch was on Saturday, and was the first ever flight of the Long March 12 rocket, and the first ever launch from the Wenchang Commercial Space Launch Site, China's fifth space launch site. Construction began in July 2022, and this time lapse shows just how much work went in to bringing it to completion. And what a way to celebrate them with the successful flight of a brand new rocket. Here's a great little video of the rocket going vertical at the pad. Long March 12 is a 3.8 meter diameter medium lift launch vehicle built by the Shanghai Academy of Spaceflight Technology. It's able to place at least 10 tons of payload in low Earth orbit. Its first flight carried the Hulian Wang Jishu Shayan communication satellite to low Earth orbit, as well as the JSW-3 technology demonstrator. Last week also saw an orbital launch from Roscosmos. Not a lot of information has been shared about this one, but we know it was a Soyuz 2.1A launch vehicle, as usual, carrying a reconnaissance satellite to low Earth orbit from Russia's Vostochny launch site. Laon Aerospace had another busy week last week. I decided to attempt to land a NASA-style space shuttle on the Mun, a shuttle that would otherwise work well as a conventional Kerbin orbit lifter. It was a fun old time, and quite frankly, I can't believe I've never done a mission like this before. So if it sounds like a good watch for you, then it should now be clickable on screen. Follow me on Blue Sky instead of X if you want, and if you want to support what I do here, then I have a Patreon you can join as well, just like the names on the right did. I hope you enjoyed today's installment of Space This Week, but yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one or on Blue Sky. I'm posting there like regularly. So yeah, that's great.